action. So today we live in a highly connected world with a steadily increasing population and increasing demand for resources. As a nation, we pride ourselves on the freedom to live how we want and consume what we want as much as we want to. But when this infinite demand for consumption collides with finite resources and finite space, this creates a challenge. Our current consumption habits are not sustainable and the earth has responded unfavorably to our consumption. Our home is becoming warmer every year, the poles are melting, and the land we are already competing for is getting smaller and smaller as a result of this. Millions of people along coastlines and island nations will, will be displaced from their homes as the effect of global warming begins to take hold. We can't control this infinite demand for consumption, but we can control what we consume and how we consume it. And that is what our team is striving for, a sustainable alternative to oil that can curb the rate of global warming. So how do we get here? The United States' addiction to oil began during the Industrial Revolution when cheaper, more accessible fossil fuel quickly dominated coal in the transportation sector. After it was discovered that oil could be a viable fuel source, American entrepreneurs like George Bissell uh, were eager to find locations where this new resource could be exploited. Bissell hired Edwin L. Drake to drill for oil in a well-known oil seat in Titusville, PA, and it was here that the first successful crude oil well was established in 1859. This crude oil was refined and produced into a byproduct we know as kerosene, because at the time, gasoline was considered too dangerous to use. The first uses of kerosene date back to the Civil War, where it was put in gas lamps and provided heat and light. However, after the invention of the light bulb by Thomas Edison, this became obsolete and provided the paradigm shift needed to begin using oil as gasoline. This is when another American entrepreneur, John D. Rockefeller, realized the potential impact oil could have on the American economy, and he began to build his empire. In 1859, Rockefeller invests in, the Cle in a Cleveland oil, oil refinery, and by 1865, he takes out a loan to buy out his partners, and thus giving him the largest oil refinery in Cleveland. Uh, the company's, company's ability to market, produce, transport, and refine petroleum better than his competitors quickly gave Rockefeller control over the entire industry. However, in 1890, Congress passes the Sherman Antitrust Act, giving Congress the power to regulate interstate commerce. And although it took over 20 years, by 1911, Standard Oil Company had dissolved into 34 smaller companies, some of which you may know today, Exxon Mobil, Marathon, and Amco. So during the 1800s, uh, a better alternative was needed than the horse and buggy. Three main fuel types emerged to fill this gap. Cheap, abundant, reliable, and high energy density gasoline easily defeated coal and electric. And the tipping point for gasoline was the advent of the internal combustion engine and the Model T by Henry Ford. Before, Ford. before Ford's Model T, cars were luxury vehicles that only the wealthy could afford. Once Ford perfected the assembly line and gasoline vehicles were being mass produced, this catapulted gasoline to first place as a fuel source. With cars flying off the assembly line and oil refineries cropping up all over the US, there needed to be an infrastructure in place to get this oil to the consumer. By World War I, oil pipelines began to form the oil infrastructure in the US. By 1920, there were approximately 115,000 miles of oil pipelines in the U.S. During World War II, America lost 48 oil tankers offshore, uh, off the eastern shore, and to fix this, large diameter land-based pipelines were put in place that delivered oil from Texas and Oklahoma. These pipelines are still in use today. As you can see, in 2015, for the United States Department of Transportation, there are over 1.7 million miles of gas and oil pipelines. Uh, the up until the early 1900s, the United States produced between 60 and 70 percent of the world's oil supply, and President Roosevelt began to have concerns over its availability. In 1908, he appointed the National Conservation Commission to take an inventory of America's natural resources. In 1909, the NCC delivered its findings to Congress, reporting that there was only 25 to 30 years left of proven oil preserves. This caused America's first oil scare and forced us to look at countries like Mexico, Iraq, Iran, and Venezuela for oil imports. Okay. However, in 1924, Texas, Oklahoma, and California experienced an oil boom that temporarily mitigated this scare. This oil boom caused the price of oil to plummet to 10 cents per barrel, and regulations had to be set to raise those prices back up. Due to this price drop, OPEC was created to help manage oil exportation and prevent oil prices from plummeting again. In 1954, Marion King Hubbard was tasked by the Shell Oil Company for developing a peak oil curve for the United States. The curve incorporated cumulative oil production, proven oil reserves, and future discoveries, all as a single bell curve. Using his raw data, he found that the U.S. would reach a peak oil production in the year 1970, and while his prediction was doubted by many, it definitely didn't change any of our consumption patterns. 
at the same time, car culture in America was exploding. People were not driving just to get somewhere, they were driving as a social activity. People wanted the biggest, fastest, most stylish cars. They wanted the muscle cars, which is the muscle car era. The ones that would attract all the attention and get all the ladies. <clears throat> so, it was this culture along with cheap gas prices that led to increased consumption and that resulted in the 1973 oil crash. In 1973, Syria and Egypt invaded Israel in the Yom Kippur War, and six days later, the U.S. provided aid. In response to this, the, the OPEC announced an oil embargo against Canada, the U.K., the U.S., the Netherlands, and Japan. Uh, this raised the price of oil by about 70% in under a year. This sent, uh, sent these countries into an oil shock. When the U.S. could not manage any longer, the Nixon administration convinced Israel to pull out of the countries that they were presiding in, and shortly after, the Arab oil ministers lifted the oil embargo in December 1974, ending the crash. Uh, so after the, after the first oil crisis, Hubbard continued his research on oil production, but this time he analyzed it on a global perspective. From this research, Hubbard, Hubbard then predicted that there would be a global oil production peak in 1995 if the current rate of consumption continued. Soon after this prediction was released, a second oil crisis erupted in the United States. In 1978, uh, there was another oil crisis due to the, or excuse me, the 1978 oil crisis was the result of a decreased oil output from its foreign imports in the wake of the Iranian Revolution. The global oil supply only decreased by, decreased by about 4% of the widespread, widespread panic in the United States is what drove the price per barrel far higher than justified by the supply. The price per barrel more than doubled and odd evening rationing had to be implemented in the United States. Um, so basically what odd, odd evening was, odd evening rationing was, um, Americans could, could only get gas on certain days of the week based off their license plate number, I believe it was the first number of the license plate number, and they were also limited by how much gas they could purchase. Um, so this crisis clearly showed how vulnerable the U.S. was to foreign oil supply, and thus a management council was needed to promote U.S. energy independence by further diversifying our energy portfolio. Uh, so when inaugurated in January of 1977, President Carter addressed the need to put federal energy activities under one umbrella and provided the framework for a national energy plan. Through his efforts, the Department of Energy was formed in 1977. The Office of Fuels Development Office of Fuels Development was one of the government energy programs created under this new Department of Energy. Uh, they wanted to create a program to develop renewable fuels for transportation for algae. The end, the end result of this was the Aquatic Species Program being started in 1978. The main focus of this program was to achieve the production of biodiesel from high lipid content algae grown in ponds while utilizing waste carbon dioxide from coal-fired power plants. Researchers in the Aquatic Species Program also wanted to identify specific strains that had high lipid content, along with being able to survive in severe conditions. The researchers collected over 3,000 strains of algae, and after screening, isolation, and characterization efforts, the collection was reduced to reduce 300 strains. Eventually, funding started to become a problem for this program due to federal government's idea of downsizing. But on top of a lack of funding, oil prices also began to drop in the 80s and the 90s, and the need to find an alternative fuel source was not the forefront of American minds anymore. Thus, in 1996, the Aquatic Species Program was shut down. The program concluded that production of microalgae used for fuels is not limited by engineering designs, but limited by the many cultivation issues. The issues range from species control in large outdoor systems to the harvesting and lipid accumulation and to overall productivity. Once this program was shut down, the focus on the bioethanol sector began to grow. So at the turn of the century, oil prices were still low, but due to political issues, they were steadily rising. The U.S. was importing about 75% of its total oil consumption and oil, er, and oil production was declining. The United States saw this as an energy security issue and knew they were still vulnerable to foreign oil supplies. In 2003, the U.S. invaded Iraq due to public perception of Iraq having an influence on the attack on September 11, 2001, and the U.S. was fearful of Iraq possessing, possessing weapons of mass destruction. The primary goal of this invasion was to secure Iraq's oil fields. The third largest, of the, world, third largest in the world at the time, as well as other resources by entering the re regime of Saddam Hussein. The U.S. wanted to give Iraq's oil reserves back to the Iraqi citizens to promote the economic health of Iraq and to create an ally with them as well. 
In the meantime, the U.S. reliance on foreign fuels increased with their position in war. This brought about the 2005 Energy Policy Act. Some provisions of this act included increasing the amount of biofuels that must be mixed with gasoline sold in the U.S., usually ethanol, as well as having 25% of renewable energy used by end users in the U.S. by 2025. Agencies like the Department of Navy and Department of Energy aggressively wanted to achieve this goal. This facilitated the establishment of the Renewable Energy Strategy that helped promote research and adoption of renewable energy sources. This act also influenced a larger production of ethanol, stimulating 27 new ethanol plants and 401 new E85 gas station pumps installed. And in 2006, 1.4 billion barrels of ethanol were produced. And the production of ethanol skyrocketed while also meeting its intended goals. This contributed to the Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, which mainly encouraged a higher fuel standard for fleets of vehicles, more efficient home appliances, and also set up regional standards for heating and cooling in the U.S. The stated purpose of this act was to move the United States towards a greater energy independence and security. The original bill sought to cut subsidies on the petroleum industry and promote petroleum independence. This was quickly dropped due to the industry's stakeholders and influence. Instead, the Renewable Fuel Standards was adopted, which requires transportation fuels sold in the U.S. to contain a minimum of 36 billion gallons of renewable fuels including cellulosic biofuels and biomass-based diesel by 2022. Since ethanol production was already increasing to meet it and meeting its intended goals, stimulating its production even further was not an issue. All this history brings us to where we are today, understanding our current oil position. So currently, 92% uh, of the transportation sector runs off of petroleum products. Uh, about 72% of all petroleum goes towards the transportation and petroleum represents 35.4% of our total energy needs. So that's a massive reliance. That's over a third of our energy coming from petrol petroleum. Uh, since we have the overall need and use of oil has increased throughout the years, the United States has been working diligently to increase their energy independence by finding more domestic sources and also diversifying who we buy our oil from. Uh, there are currently over 4,000 offshore drilling rigs between Texas, Alaska, and California making approximately 35% of the total domestic oil production. Recently, the United States has actually become a net exporter of petroleum, currently exporting roughly 5.19 million barrels per day and importing 4.87 million. Uh, looking closer at the U.S. global and global oil supply, we have a larger supply than ever before, likely due to unconventional oil extraction processes. So this, these are two graphs from the BP World Review of 2016 Statistical Review of World Energy, and the one on the le left is you, uh, oil production by region, and the one on the right is oil consumption by region from 1990 to 2015. Uh, these two graphs reflect two trends. Uh, despite the impl implementation of unconventional oil extracting practices, practices such as fracking, deep sea, uh, deep sea drilling, and Canadian tar sands, our consumption is actually still increasing faster than our production. It also reflects a growing geopolitical situation. If you notice, uh, much of the consumption growth is in the yellow, that's the Asia, Asia Pacific. Uh, these are industrializing nations. They're beginning to consume like Americans consume. And as we continue into the future, more and more countries are gonna be entering this form of industrialization. And so as supplies run short, we'll have more people competing with us for the same oil. Uh, this is also from the BP Statistical Review. Uh, this shows global oil reserves in 1995, 2005, and 2015. And we can see it's been increasing over the past years. Uh, this, again, this is likely due to unconventional oil. Um, <clears throat> that's been, it's, it's been given uh, certain subsidies. Uh, fracking has been removed from, or there, they're not restricted by the Clean Water Act of 2000, or as of 2005. And so that's made it a lot more enticing to companies that can now go onto federal land and extract oil for profit, and they don't have to worry about their pollution. Uh, this review also stated a uh, reserves over production ratio of 50.7. That means that if we kept extracting the oil at our current rates, we would drain our reserves in 50.7 years. Um, 
So despite its longevity, and, despite, and although it seems like we have an infinite supply, oil is finite. And as we continue to use up the oil that's easily accessible, we're forced to drill deeper and deeper or use unsustainable practices to get more. This increases the likelihood of disaster. 2010, the Horizon Deepwater oil well exploded when high pressure methane gas made its way up the riser to the platform where it ignited and exploded. An estimated 4.9 million barrels of oil leaked into the Gulf, devastating the region. The oceans are also damaged by oil due to increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. When carbon dioxide reacts, reacts with the ocean, carbonic acid is formed, causing the ocean to become more acidic. In the past 200 years alone, ocean water has become 30% more acidic, faster than any known change in ocean chemistry in the last 50 million years. Such a relatively quick change in ocean chemistry doesn't give marine life, which evolved over millions of years in an ocean with generally, stably, generally stable pH, much time to adapt. The use of oil also greatly contributes to the global warming. The transportation sector, the largest sector, largest consumer of oil, accounts for 28% of all greenhouse gas emissions. On top of this, oil not only creates environmental problems, but also political problems as well. Competition for oil amongst industrialized nations creates political tension because most industrialized nations depend on oil and also possess powerful weapons they are prepared to use to protect these resources. So what do we need in an, alter in an alternative to oil? We want to have a high energy content similar to that of gas or diesel. We want it to work with the existing liquid fuel infrastructure that we have today. Uh, we want it to be sustainable and we want, it to be, we want to have enough supply of it to meet our demands. And best of all, we need it to be economical. It has to be able to be competitive with oil prices today. So what are the alternatives? Uh, hydrogen power. Hydrogen is an alternative energy <coughs> resource that is both clean and abundant. <coughs> However, high, density, uh, high densities of hydrogen power are difficult to store and transport. The in infrastructure for this resource is not in place yet, and the technology is simply not at the point where this resource can be economically viable. Electric power. Electric power cars have zero emissions, and if a way to generate clean energy is found from other non-renewables like wind, solar, or hydro, it's possible to eliminate those emissions from the transportation sector entirely. As of 2015, and per the EIA, 28% of U.S. energy consumption is used by the transportation sector, of which petroleum provides 92%. To make electric power more mainstream, a massive infrastructure upgrade for the grid would be required, as well as the installation of many recharging stations worldwide. Almost everyone around the globe would have to purchase a new electric vehicle. Other biofuels. The infrastructure is already in place for other biofuels um, like ethanol and biodiesel. Ethanol comes from the sugars of plants and biodiesels from the lipids. Ethanol is a popular alternative and most gasoline in the U.S. is mixed with about 10% ethanol. These options require huge amounts of land, water, and other resources that could be otherwise used for the population. So why, what makes algae so attractive? Uh, for one, it has a rapid growth time. It can double its population or its, its size in uh, 24 to 48 hours. Uh, it does not use agricultural land. Uh, saltwater species mean that we can actually grow it in the ocean. Uh, it's carbon neutral, which means all the carbon we're releasing when we burn it is captured while it's growing. It's, it's not gonna be releasing any excess carbon that was stored millions of years ago. Uh, it's got the highest oil content of any other biodiesel crop. Uh, here we see, even on a bad day, it's producing 1,200 uh, gallons of oil per acre per year. Uh, it can get up to 10,000. Um, and it also has co-product and co-process opportunities that I'll talk about later. So the saltwater aspect of the algae actually makes it really appealing because we have massive oceans. Our planet is 70, 75% of salt water and it actually is filled with these dead zones that the uh, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration identified. These black zones are places where the surface water has little to no life. So these actually represent possible fields, possibly the oil fields of the future if we grow algae there and extract it for uh, biofuel purposes. Uh, another very attractive thing and probably essential for the success of algae biofuel is the useful co-products. It produces other products that can be sold for additional cash flow that might actually make algae bio, biofuel more economically feasible. Things such as the vitamins astaxanthin, which is worth about $3,000 to $5,000 a kilogram, could 
easily make algae a, a reasonable way to get fuel if it's a byproduct while you're actually trying to get example, astaxanthin. Uh, there's other byproducts such as feedstock that can go to animals, uh, dyes, uh, lab agar, and ethanol via fermentation. So the two main issues with algae is actually the cultivation. It's hard to get enough nutrients to grow the stuff and it's hard to contain it. It's a living organism. It might die off. It might move somewhere where you didn't intend it to move. Uh, also harvesting. Harvesting uh, something that makes 1% of the actual thing you're suck sucking up is hard. It's hard to get that 1% out from the 99%. All right, so now we're gonna get into our methods. Good stuff. Uh, so we were choosing our species. Uh, we decided to choose Nanochloropsis, and we're passing that around right now. Uh, that came in these little 30 milliliter vials. And the reason we chose this species is because it's a fast-growing saltwater microalgae. As uh, Pearson stated earlier, it doubles in about 24 to 48 hours. Uh, it also has a high lipid content. 25 to 50 percent of its dry ash weight is oil. And uh, it was also one of the 300 species identified in the Aquatic Species Program as having high uh, lipid content. And the best of all, it was cheap to purchase. We paid, I think, $8 for six vials of 30 milliliter algae, and we grew that up to about 120 gallons. Um, so that's what we're showing here. This is the sizing up process we went through. Um, so when we bought it from the company, they recommended that you mix 10 milliliters of the stock culture with about 200 milliliters of salt water. So each one of those vials is about 30 milliliters. So what we did was we took two vials, put it into a 1200 milliliter beaker of salt water. And uh, as you can see here, we have like air pumps inside to kind of keep the algae moving. And uh, that blue bin it's sitting in is a water bath. So we put water in there at the level that the algae was at, put a heater in there to keep it at the proper temperature. And this whole setup here is sitting under our, uh, our lights at the time. And uh, Chris is gonna get in greater detail of the growing process. So our specific strain of nanocoropsis uh, needed a consistent environment to grow in. Um, the optimal environment was an aqueous solution with a salinity of around 37 parts per thousand. Um, to achieve that salinity, we used a salt water, or we used salt and water, just mixed it together. Um, we used a ratio of 39 grams per, of salt per liter of water to obtain about 35 to 40 parts per thousand salinity. The salinity needed to be measured with a recractometer after mixing to ensure that the proper amounts of salt and water were added, and that's what you can see here. Um, the temperature of the algae was also another important factor that we had to take into consideration. Um, our aquarium heaters that we kept inside of our tub were set to 75 degrees Fahrenheit to mimic the temperatures around the equator that you saw in those dead zones earlier. Um, another important factor was the strength and duration of light exposure. Uh, we used two grow lights, a 600 watt metal halide light and a 1000 watt high pressure sodium light. Um, these lights were set to a 16 hours on, 8 hours off cycle. Um, we also used Kent Pro Culture parts A and B to provide nutrients to our algae. Part A contains trace minerals like iron, part B is mostly nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, water circulation pumps were also used within the culture to agitate the algae and keep it in motion. So to ensure the health of our 120 gallon culture, an automated top off system was created. As the water evaporated, it left the salt in the water, which increased the salinity of our algae culture. Um, to mitigate that, we use this top off system, which is essentially just a buoy that lowers when the water level lowers. And our 55 gallon top off system was filled with fresh water to put that necessary water back into our system. We noted that about every week, about seven gallons of water would evaporate from the culture with the top-off system replenished. We also needed to quantify the cell density. Cell counts were used to observe the algae cell concentration and to observe how healthy our algae cells were. Um, 15 microliters of algae would be pipetted onto the hemocytometer slide under a light microscope, uh, shown here. Uh, using the 40x objective lens, cells are counted using the slide's grid, which is in the top right photo. Um, we would count the number of cells in each corner as well as the center to get an average cell density for our total concentration of algae. And as you can see, there's many cells to count and this process is very time consuming. To, so to make that process faster, we started using a spectrophotometer. So to more quickly quantify the cell de density, we use this to measure the absorption. Uh, 
algae was placed into the slide and it was closed and absorption readings were, readings were taken. We could correlate these readings with cell counts done by hand and generate this graph. Um, we have this trend line curve and equation that we could use to predict future algae cell densities. And the red that you see was our first trial um, and our green was our second. In between those trials, we did feed the algae, so there was kind of a spike. Um, and all of the blue was just our early cultivation values that we got to generate the graph. And in the bottom left, you can see a slide of our control algae versus our concentrated. Okay, so before we could actually start harvesting our algae, because we were working with the dangerous volatile chemicals like hexate, we had to get a standard operating procedures in place. This is like an industry standard. So we developed them, wrote them, met with Marcella, the risk management uh, coordinator of JMU, and we actually ended up passing our SOPs. So that was an industry professional saying that we had come up with something that was suitable. Uh, so following on safety protocols, every time we would wear these gloves to keep the hexane from burning your skin, uh, safety glasses, close-toed shoes, and the fume hood which uses a fan that's way too powerful for it. So it's like extra safe, like it's pumping air through there. It's a uh, industrial paint fan. <clears throat> uh, so once the SOPs were in place, we were ready to begin cultivating or uh, harvesting, but there was one more problem. Uh, we had gone on, uh, the previous group had gone on to eBay and purchased a large centrifuge, that's this refrigerator looking like thing down here, because their old one was way too small and couldn't centrifuge enough of the volume. They spent a thousand dollars on it. When it got here, it didn't work. Uh, we contact, they contacted the people, got the money back. They asked for the centrifuge to come back. We said, okay, pay for the shipping. They said no, so we got to keep it for free, but it was broken. So one of the first things we had to do was try to repair the centrifuge. So we bought us a repair manual for $250, and one day we were sitting there digging in, and we were checking on the motor brushes, which are these little things that give power to the uh, electric motor, and they were welded to the side of their casing, so they weren't actually touching it. So we had to disassemble the entire uh, electric motor of the centrifuge uh, and replace the broken uh, motor brushes. And now we have a working like, $25,000 per piece of equipment. All right, so that brings us to uh, concentrating our algae, and this was actually the goal of our experiment all along. So the way we accomplish this is we would take 500 milliliters of algae solution from our, our uh, storage tank, and we would fill the four cups of the centrifuge, and we would centrifuge that for a minute at 2,500 RPMs. Um, so after we did that, we would take those, these um, the black bowls out of the centrifuge, and we would use a turkey baser to suck off the top layer uh, exactly 250 milliliters off the top layer there and then we would take that the algae left in that centrifuge bucket and dump it into our uh, larger bucket here we had to repeat this process 15 times to get 15 liters of algae to run through the harvester so we would get about one liter of concentrated algae per spin and this brings us to the harvester setup Let's slide it over so this looks pretty complicated. I remember the first time I looked at it, it just looks like a bunch of tubes. <laughs> um, but it's actually very simple. So these two tubes here, this is your uh, hexane, or excuse me, this is your algae input. So this, this, is, this tube would go into the algae bucket with the concentrated algae. This tube here is simply for priming. So this would just be going into a bucket of water. And then this tube here, this tube would be going into your hexane and uh, this tube here would just be going into water, another priming tube. And then the two tubes over here is where the output comes out. So we would have one tube going into an empty bucket and one tube going into a carboy. So during the priming process, we would just be putting the priming, the, the water we don't want, into the, the bucket. And then after we switch the valves, we would do that simultaneously. So we would switch the flow. The flow would switch to the hexane and the algae. And we would also switch this one after about five seconds because uh, there's still water going through the system that we don't want in the carboy. We don't want that with our actual product. Um, and so to accomplish all this, uh, we actually had to get the flow rate correct, which is really tough. Um, this knob here is what controls the flow rate. And uh, this mechanism right here controls the pressure. So we kept the pressure constant at about 50 PSI. 
And what we had to do here was we had one person monitoring the uh, beaker of hexane and another person monitoring the bucket of, um, well, it we started out with water. So we used water first to get the flow right on point. Um, Pearson would be timing the beaker of water. I would be timing the, the bucket of water. And we used, uh, we know that one little, one liter of water had to correlate with uh, 66 milliliters of uh, hexene. So we knew they had to be going at the same time. So we used a time discrepancy to really get the flow rate uh, good. So if Pearson was higher, if he had a higher flow rate with the hexane, that means we had to close the valve. If he was lower, lower time, we had to open the valve. Um, and that's how, and then after we got the flow rate perfect, um, we would uh, begin running the actual process. And this is just a little diagram, um, again, at what I explained here. So this is the hexane input, um, the hexane output, and you can see the demulsifier. So now there's your primer output. I'll come back to this. So after harvesting, uh, we fill up a carboy, just like you see here. Um, and as you can see, there's like two distinct layers. Um, we need to separate these layers. Um, so to do that, we would drain the carboy of all of the dark green as much as we could. We'd dump that top layer into a separate beaker. Um, and then we'd centrifuge that again to further separate those layers. Um, the oils and fats, also called lipids, are known as amphipathic molecules. And these molecules have two distinct um, ends to them, a water-loving hydrophilic side and a water-fearing hydrophobic side. Um, while the hydrophilic sides of a lipid will associate with the water in a solution, the hydrophobic sides of the lipid will cluster together and hide from the water. Uh, and the lipids therefore cluster together, form spheres where the hydrophobic sides are in the center away from the water, while the hydrophilic sides are on the outside, associating with the water. By using a centrifuge, we can spin the intermediate layer down, separating the less dense N-hexane from the denser amphipathic molecules. And so this is that layer after it's been centrifuged. It's very, or this is on the left is the gunk layer before it's been centrifuged. It's very thick, um, very kind of soupy. And uh, after centrifuging, we had to make sure, or while centrifuging, we had to make sure that our uh, weights were correct so that the centrifuge didn't get off balance and kind of go crazy. Um, and so on the right, you see a clear solution on top of that spun down gunk layer. It's suspended on top, and it can be easily removed with those turkey basters we talked about earlier. And then we get to reclamation. Right, so after separating the hexane and uh, oil mixture from the algae gunk, we had to put the hexane into the reclamation device. The way this works is you put the hexane and the input into here. Uh, you run a hot water in and out of this tube, so it cycles through there. And that acts as the heat source that's gonna actually <coughs> distill your hexane that has to evaporate it off. And then this is the condenser, uh, condenser part. This has cold ice water running through it, so as the hexane vapors come up into the reclamation device, into the condenser, you can catch them in here and recover some of your hexane, which saves uh, operating costs. Uh, additionally, the actual oil and some hexane, because you can't boil off all the hexane with one run, uh, you catch the oil that's actually being produced out of here. So this is a picture of what's going on on the inside. I'll take this down again. Um, these tubes have hot water running through it. The hexane oil con or solution comes through, hexane's evaporated off, and it goes into the condenser coil. And that's basically how we reclaimed the hexane, saved some operating costs, and we got the oil separated from some of the hexane. So this was our evaporation of our final solution. Um, the spun down reclaimed intermediate, intermediate layer solution was put into vials, um, shown on the left, and then thrown into a makeshift water bath that you can see on the right. Um, the hot water bath is used to evaporate the small amount of leftover hexane from that algae oil to produce our final product. So these were our results. Um, from this image, you can see that the hot, or the hot water bath 
evaporation of our final output volumes were extremely, extremely small. Um, we believe we had major losses within the reclamation system itself. Uh, we went back and we flushed the whole reclamation system through with hexane just to see what we could get out of it. And what you see on the right is, all, is essentially just algae oil concentrated that we got from after our two trial runs. Right, so before we even uh, started running our experiments, we wanted to figure out how, what, what RPM should we spin this, uh, this algae at to get the maximum concentration for our energy input. So we only really tested uh, two lower speeds. We didn't go above 2500 because we found that if you went that fast, it caked the algae on the bottom of the thing and it was just too hard to get off. So we tested 1500 RPM for one minute and 2500 RPM for one minute. And what you see here are the power curves. Uh, we used this amp meter clipped on to measure the amps using a constant voltage of 208. We calculated the kilowatts that were being drawn for each second. And uh, we multiplied, we did an integration of that. And we found that for 15 runs at 1500 RPM to, to centrifuge down 30 liters, basically, it would take 0 0.004 kilowatt hours. Uh, for 2,500, it was only slightly higher, 0 0.0068, 0 0.007. So what that told us was that using 1,500 as a base, uh, so that's like zero energy consumed, uh, that there was a 70.24% increase in energy consumption for the 2,500 RPM, but that also resulted in a 143% increase in concentration. So 2,500 was obviously a better option. Uh, so using this 2500 we ran it and we had because of our results or basically nothing because we had losses during our system uh, we had to use the last year groups findings as our control to compare our centrifuge uh, concentrated data to so what we found was that compared to last year's system which they only, they only accounted the energy used in the harvester, which is only one part of the process. Compared with their energy readings, we were using 172% more, 172 more energy for a net benefit of 63% more energy out. So it, was, it wasn't really worth it in the end. I think if we looked at it throughout the whole process, all the energy inputs are 0 0.006 would not be as high of a would not have such a big impact on the energy input. Uh, so to conclude, uh, we didn't get any useful data from our experiment due to this, um, and it's difficult to draw a concrete conclusion on the effectiveness of pre centrifuging algae because of this. Uh, however, based on our assumptions and spectra data, we concluded that the pre centrifuging algae to increase cell density does not yield enough energy output to justify doing it in the first place. Uh, however, we were able to get out oil from the system, thus proving again the system does indeed work, yet it still needs to be improved to be a feasible alternative to oil. Uh, so taking a holistic uh, view at this, after conducting our experiments and reaching the conclusion on the net energy balance for the harvesting process, uh, we determined it wasn't worth it. Uh, but beyond that, algae oil also faces other uh, obstacles other than just the return on energy input. Uh, there are stakeholders here, there's very powerful stakeholders in the oil business that would love to see us fail, love to see algae fail. Uh, so we have to take that into account when we're assessing the actual viability of this future resource. Uh, there's also, uh, there's also, uh, problems uh, with the large-scale harvesting of algae in the ocean because of environmental concerns. It's hard to contain where the algae is going to move if a storm blows in or if a uh, current carries the algae somewhere like a coral reef. There could be drastic environmental consequences and that's something that would need to be solved before it could uh, actually become a viable solution. Uh, again, with the open waters, international waters, what country is going to have the algae? Whose algae is it? What happens if another country steals it? There's geopolitical issues associated with the large-scale algae cultivation. Uh, again, you're dealing with a living organism. You can't control if it catches a disease. 
or if something preys on it, you you have to get society used to a a supply of an energy supply that could disappear because of like a disease instead of oil that we know it's there, we can always get it, it's not moving, it's not gonna die. Uh, there's also policy issues. There's currently like no policy in place for the development of algae biofuels, so significant legislation or legislative actions would need to be taken before this could actually go into place. So we'd like to thank Dr. Bachman for his advice for his advisement and support throughout this project. We'd like to thank our parents for pushing us to succeed and always supporting us. Um, we'd like to thank Mark or Mike Rummel for his interest in mechanical expertise and willingness to chaperone us, um, especially with the centrifuge. We'd also like to thank Eddie for relocating our equipment over the summer and letting us use his lab. We'd also like to thank Wes Pence for his donation of a emulsifying machine to the team's efforts. Questions? Yes. Oh, I think you guys make great points about you know why algae might not be the best option for right now. Is, do you guys have any ideas about what might be the next option or the next best option for a viable solution? Um, I, I, it's something I've been thinking about. Um, it's possible that we could go electric with that route. Obviously, the grid needs to be boosted up. Um, as I was, I was telling these guys last night, though. You never know in the future, maybe everyone will have a solar panel on the roof and that'll take some of the relief off the grid. Um, and then again, there's new farming practices happening. Ethanol could take off again. Um, I just saw a video the other day of uh, they're growing, they're farming in a warehouse as opposed to a field and they're saving 95% water. If we And they're closer to the point of consumption. If we change, more changes will have to happen outside of just algae fueled and like oil. Um, a lot of societal changes. Saw you first. All right, sorry. No. Um, I think it's normal to have a uh, input and output ratio of energy because with this kind of small scale. So I'm thinking how the scale going to factor in this process. If you scale up, have industrialized the production, right. I think the ratio will be a little bit different. I don't, I don't know. It might be worth it. It might be not but the skill definitely uh, matters in, in, in this. Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely something that it's hard for us to assess because it's, there's not, like what our plan for it, there's not really anything in place like that. Industrial scale, um, like a refined industrial scale process uh, for, this, for this system, I think would probably work out really well. Um, if you got some real engineers in there instead of just a couple ISAT seniors, probably get something done. But it's hard to say. Yeah, these are imperfect devices as well. So. Are there any uh, lower classmen coming up to follow up your work? Not so far. No, one maybe, one possibly. There's, yeah, there's one that is thinking about it, thinking about but it. hasn't decided. So yeah. for next year, uh, no one, no one decided to pick up the algebra project. Yes, we need to meet the professors to lobby for us. <laughs> It's a big project, and even with three of us, it was a lot to get done, um, despite all of our setbacks, but if another team's brave enough, I think they could do it. Any other questions? All right, thanks for having us yeah. today. I think it's worth it to spend the energy. You know, you put it, get out, less energy to put in. What's that? I think it's worth it even though you put it put out, less energy to put in. Because you're, what you do is you generate a particular form of energy source. Right. Source, I think, is new. Ultimately, it's